Good afternoon, I'm Dave Mann, Chair of ADM, and for my sins I've been asked to tell you about my ideas on antennas. Um, well, you might say, well, what do you know about antennas? Well, when I was a lad, I was an apprentice at EMI in Hayes. EMI had an antenna division and we used to design and build transmitting antennas for broadcasters and we used to put uh, antennas all over the world. So for the first five years of my working life I used to go to work every day on the 140 bus, uh, an hour's journey and come back home the same way. That's, that's a picture of one of the buildings at EMI and the I don't know how make this work. The antenna design and manufacturing division was down there. Um, <coughs> these days, you think it was a fantastic job, but in, in those days it just seemed normal to be offered an apprenticeship. Um, very exciting. The, one of the histories of EMI is that it built the uh, whoops, Sorry. Go back. It won't go back. Oh! <laughs> Let me go back. Oh, okay. I'll Okay. If we go back to the Alexander Palace. Back, 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 back. That's it. That's the Alexander Palace uh, station, which is the first broadcaster, if not in the world, certainly in the UK, and that had a band one full wavelength dipole antenna at the top, two full wavelength dipoles, one above the other, and the EMI designed and built that, and the designer was Mr. Cork, and that's an actual slide he took in 1936 of the antenna system. When I was there, he uh, retired and everybody else was so pleased to see the back of him that they put all his slides and everything in the bin. So I pulled them out and took them home. Um, so that's a bit of history. The sort of antennas that I used to work on were... Uh, whoops. Oh dear. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I spent six months of my life up there. That's a thousand foot mast. Uh, it was the first thousand foot mast in the UK and it was the first band three antenna that EMI made and we had quite a few problems with it so none of the engineers who were much older than me wanted to go up there so they sent me up there all the time <laughs> we spent a, 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 a lot of time up there fortunately it was a beautiful summer and uh, I had quite a good time at the top of that mast there was a temporary lift which used to take us up there quite quickly. When they took the lift away, it used to take two hours to get to the top. I have got down in five minutes. But <laughs> uh, Dave, were you the first person in the UK to become a member of the Thousand Foot Club? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the riggers did it before. <laughs> oh. uh, yes. Uh, I found this on YouTube. That's me. 1959. <laughs> While we were up there, this aircraft was flying round and round and round. I couldn't work out what it was doing. Then we realised it was filming. So I, I ran up the top 100 foot and started waving to it. And I found that on YouTube, much to my amazement. <laughs> Actually, the opening sequence for Anglia Television. So if you could YouTube Anglia Television, you'll see it. Yes. In those days, we didn't have network analyzers. We had bridges, and that's a, a, a GR bridge, a bridge made by General Radio, which uh, measures resistance and reactance. And we used to take these to the top of the mast together with our Edison VHF receiver and signal generator, and plot the uh, <coughs> loss of the antenna up at the top of the mast. Um, these days, of course, we use a network analyzer and that can be operated 
remotely. Uh, much easier, much easier. So, with the GR bridge, we plotted the uh, resistance reactors onto this Smith chart, which I just happen to have here. Um, Fifty-year-old piece of plastic that I made myself, and using that we would adjust the components to get the impedance very, very accurate. I think it was uh, 1.02, it would be the effective SWR across the TV band, which was quite a tall order in those days. Now we use a network analyzer that uh, generates the Smith chart for us and we don't need to have any complicated bits of plastic. Um, more recently my company has been making wireless cameras, sort of cameras you see on people's shoulders interviewing the Prime Minister and cameras in racing cars and so on and I developed quite a range of antennas for use with those cameras. Uh, Tony is not here at the moment, G1HPD, he actually makes them. So I design them, he makes them. <laughs> and there's a, a variety of other things there. Um, that's one of my toes in the pits of something somewhere. Um, these transmitters work on a variety of frequencies, plus being about 1.5 gigs and the highest being uh, just under 8 gigs. So what's all this to do with amateur radio? Well, I, I get very upset when people use inefficient antennas. You spend a lot of money on a 200 watt PA for 23 cents or a lot of money on a 0.5 dB noise factor preamp and often the performance advantage you get from those devices is totally wasted in having an inefficient antenna. Uh, How does an antenna radiate? Well, that's the radiating element of an antenna. It also applies to the reflector and the directors. And that shows the current flow in the antenna. Now, you may remember from your college days um, that the part of the antenna that radiates is the part where the current is alternating the most. So the ends of the elements don't radiate at all. No current flows here. It's got nowhere to go. And the maximum current is in the centre of the dipole or reflector or director, which is where the RF signal comes from. So whatever you do, you have to protect the centre of the element. So we look at <coughs> uh, typical Wi-Fi Yagi and you see all the bits that do the radiating are hidden inside the boom. <laughs> it's absolutely useless. So a Yagi like that wouldn't be much better than a dipole. And they're, they're selling it as a 10-15 dB gain device which it, it, it would be impossible for it to be like that. Uh, so for bands um, 70 cents and above you must not put your your rod through the boom. It's okay on two meters because the boom is relatively small in relation to the length of the element. So if you see an antenna like that, just take it down the scrap. scratch. That's how you should do it. Again, that's made by Tony. I've got one over there uh, where the element is stood off from the boom, uh, preferably in multiples of a half wavelength. If they're a quarter wavelength off the boom, it encourages it to go up vertically. If they're a half wavelength off of the boom, it encourages it to go along the length of the elements. Um, balance. Balance are uh, that's a typical amateur radio balance. It's a half wave loop and it converts the unbalanced signal from the coax, the outer of the coax to the ground and the in, in, inner is going up and down 
the other side of the dipole is going opposite, up and down in the opposite phase. So by feeding it with a halfway length fluid where you get a 180 degree pitch, pitch shift, you can convert uh, unbalanced balance, which is fine. The disadvantage of that is you're putting a tuned circuit in parallel with the dipole, which is reducing its bandwidth. Also, that is only a halfway length at one frequency. So at, at frequency other than the, the mid frequency, the, the phase shift is <coughs> not 180 degrees and you, the balance ceases to work like a bow. So all that's a bow and it's better than most. There are better ways. There's another terrible bow and that's the J-ring bow where they wind bits, bits of wire halfway back long around a bit of aluminium rod and that is one of the most inefficient bowers you'll ever come across. That's pretty inefficient too. People wind, wind a uh, coil of wire, or coax, they turn into a coil of wire, which uh, again, due to the reactance of the coil, stops the current flowing down the outer of the coax. But it means that the current is radiating off of the coil. So you're wasting power perhaps up to 30% of it, radiating off this coil. On, on receive, this coil also receives. So it, apart from receiving the signal that you want to receive in the direction of the beam, you're picking up Mrs. Smith's flat screen telly on this coil. And uh, again, it's a very bad way of doing it, but a lot of companies do make antennas using these, these principles. There's another bad one, that, that is, uh, I bought a Yagi like that, and um, the coax is joined across the pilot polar dipole, and then they stop the current going down the outer of the coax by having a quarter wave sleeve across the top of the coax. Now, what happens to the power that would have flowed down the out of the case? Well, it's radiated by the sleeve. So the, the dipole is doing some of the radiation and the sleeve is doing some of the radiation completely in the wrong direction. <laughs> and again, you can lose 30% of the power uh, from that sleeve going in any direction that you want and it will pick up interference from other sources. Um, my solution, which is not unique to me, I have read it in books, is to take a, in, for 70 cents, a bit of 141 semi rigid coax, um, make the folded dipole out of the part of the coax. So the, <coughs> coax, the inner comes across at the feedback <coughs> and joins a bit of brass, which is the same size. So that's your folded dipole. You're feeding it. Uh, at, at the, properly at the feed point and, and if you take this end of the dipole and this end of the dipole they're in opposite phase so that point is naturally at ground and you can join the coax out or on at that point without losing any RF down the outer of the coax and that uh, <coughs> that works so well that people don't believe it but uh, I tried uh, I put a one of the ones with a sleeve ballon up at Paul's house and we received the, uh, the beacon from uh, ON beacon and it was S1 on the meter of the particular rig we were using. We changed it from the same yard view but with this driven element and it was S8. So it can give you some very dramatic improvements in performance by having a, a proper very low loss ballon. Um, there's a, a drawing of it which is uh, <coughs> not challenger, but uh, I've got a printed picture of that if anyone's interested. There's a picture of it, so we can see the 141 goes around here and it connects to a type N connector and the junction to the other half of the dipole is in this heat sleeving here and that shows you the 
standing way brush go across the 70 cent band and you said it covers the whole band whereas the original antenna is certainly so this is much wider and the loss is much lower uh, you can also make two meter versions or six meter versions or whatever you like the, uh, it's a little bit easier at two meters than six meters because the tube that the loop for the um, dipole is made of is thick enough to enable you to get a bit of coax inside it. So I'll use a bit of uh, mini RG8 through the inside of the tube, uh, the inner joints to the other side of the tube there, and it's uh, relatively easy, easily done and it gives you the same advantage on two meters that we previously seen on 70 cents. Uh, there's a two meter version. Uh, again, you can see it covers the whole band. If you particularly want to concentrate on SSB, you can move this point down a bit, but uh, that does work quite well. So, <coughs> another element, driven element that I, I like to use is a slot. Um, uh, microwave frequencies particularly, the current only flows in the outer few nanometers of the surface of a conductor. So when you're using wire, a thin bit of wire, there's not much of the wire that is actually used to, to conduct the signal. Whereas if you use a slot, you've got a lot of that chunk of brass or whatever to uh, conduct the, 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 the power and uh, it's, the loss is very much less. Um, if you make a slot halfway from the impedance at the center is 300 ohms. Uh, the impedance at the center of a folded dipole is also 300 ohms, so you can replace a folded dipole in your wonderful Yagi with a slot. Uh, and there's an example of a 13 centimeter version. This is the slot driven element with a metal plate reflector. Again, you can use an automatic button by feeding a bit of 141 semi rigid coax up the metal that makes the slot. The bottom of the slot is naturally at ground, so the there won't be any current flowing down the outer of the coax and as the coax comes up the slot to the centre uh, you can drive the slot at the centre. Now by moving the slot nearer to the driven elements the drive impedance of the slot has changed from 300 ohms to 50 ohms. The same principle that uh, applies when you use a folded dipole. We use folded dipoles because the driven elements reduce the impedance, feed impedance of the folded dipole. So by putting it up to 300 ohms, you can bring it down to 50 ohms using the driven elements and the reflector. Uh, I've got two antennas over there. That's the 13 cent version and the 23 cent version. And have a look at them if you wish. I've got some drawings with me which will show you how to make these. So you can hacksaw the back end off of your lovely Yagi and put one of these on and notice the improvements. What you have to do is to adjust the spacing here for best match, and it's quite critical. A millimeter or two either way makes quite a lot of difference. That's the 23 centimeter version, and you can see it's very wide band. Most, well, in fact, all the RVs you buy will only cover part of the 23 centimeter band. Whereas if you make this driven element, it will cover the whole band. Those markers are at uh, um, 1248 and 1308, so that's a typical repeater output, and that's a typical repeater input. This is the SSB part of the band.
Um, one of the problems with repeaters is we like to use omnidirectional polarized uh, omnidirectional beam width with horizontal polarization. Now, if you have a vertical dipole, that automatically gives you all-round coverage. If you use uh, a dipole horizontally, you get a figure of eight, and people use awful slots and all sorts of things to try and get an omnidirectional polar diagram. Most of those antennas, especially awful slots, are quite bossy. All the slots have a very high Q between the circuit and a high Q chain circuit, so I'm narrow there and lost. It. Whereas if, if you can make an antenna that doesn't use a, a, a folded loop and uses an open slot like that, um, then you, you can make a, a non directional antenna. This is an antenna invented by Alan Gay, used for broadcasting bands 1, 2, and 3. And if you look carefully, you can see slots and uh, reflectors rather like, whoops, wrong way. <laughs> that, that is the, um, what, what we were just looking at. So this is the edges of the slot. They put one either side of the uh, support tube, uh, which holds the whole thing up. So there's one. But, uh, that's what I think is a band two one in America. And you, if you've got the energy, you can stack them up and get lots of gain. Um, so uh, the, the, the last thing about these, you, you get four coaxes, and you've got to feed the two coaxes there at 180 degrees from each other, and then the two that feed in this direction compared to the two that feed in that direction at 90 degrees. So you end up with four coaxes, which is quite a complicated uh, feeder arrangement. So, well, this one I built earlier. Um, that's my foot at the top of a MOS band 3 antenna that we put up in Nigeria. And you can see the, the slots here and the basic shape of the antenna, which is called a bat wing antenna. Uh, it's quite a bit of going. So I thought, well, well, I don't particularly want to have four coaxes. Supposing I make a batwing antenna uh, and feed the batwing with a single coax, um, a slot antenna, if you reduce the width of the slot, you can bring down the impedance. So I, I, I tried it. I made the prototype. And you can see it's an unbelievably good match at uh, 23 centimetres. I'll put it here. I might have it here. Why are you getting it out, David? Sorry? Why are you getting it out? Can you go the question? Yes. What was the influence of the pole going the middle length? Did that not start the circulating current in the room? Well, it separates the two slots, are, are separated. And providing the pole isn't too large in diameter, that doesn't matter too much. Significant, right? Yeah, that's the prototype I made. Just draw the thing on a bit of paper, stick some sticky copper tape over it, and measure it. And that, oops, I've changed slides for some reason. And that is the, the end result. It took me a couple of goes to get the size right. Why this works is that if you have a um, piece of metal which is a half wavelength wide, this, uh, it's more or less like a dipole, and the, all the slots are doing is holding the thing together. Um, so the man, a man at RCA said, well, if we reduce the width uh, in the center of the slot, we will encourage the current, more current to flow up and down uh, towards the ends of the slot. Therefore, you've got like three dipoles, and the, the gain is higher. So that's why they've been making the back twin antennas. So having made that, I then want to make a, a four a two-way version to give me omnidirectional polarization. And I've got as far as making that. 
people I haven't yet connected any characters to it to see if it works. He's done the work, you know, we've put it at the top of the screen, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could do it. So that's um, a back wing antenna, which um, essentially is going to be very good. Does this, is the surface finish significant in terms of current flow? If it was really coarse, yes, but a uh, fine bit of memory is it's good enough. To no, I meant copper or brass. Oh, I see. Uh, brass or copper would be fine. Don't use aluminium because it's difficult to solve to. So that's the. And, um, we're, we're, I hope that we'll try this on GB3 HP, which we are in the process of rebuilding. Um, last subject: uh, bicone antennas. You've probably seen disco antennas for sale in the in the amateur radio shops. Um, if you try and make a disco and antenna work, the performance you get from it is very, very poor. And it's true it's got a wide bandwidth, but if you can get the SWR better than three or four to one, you're a better man than me. <laughs> but if you use a bike cone antenna, uh, and if you make the angle between the two cones precisely 80 degrees, you get a, a very nice 50 ohm match. And an antenna like that with a 50 millimeter diameter cone will give you a, a less than 1.51 SWR between 1.4 and 10 gigs. Phenomenally wide bandwidth and a uh, tolerable amount of gain. So On horizontal polarization, is it? No, it's, it's vertical, vertical polarization. The end. <laughs> Any questions? That, that is, how, how big is the um, micro? Uh, what, what are the dimensions? What, what are the dimensions of the um, bicone? Uh, uh, I've got one here. I think I had the one before on there, didn't I? Yes, it's a 50 millimetre diameter cone in a plastic tube, so there's one I made earlier. And that's a 1.4 gig? That's 1.4 to 10 gig. It may go higher than 10 gig, but my test got done. If you look in the uh, antenna manuals on how to make a bicone antenna, it never tells you what that angle should be. And the drawings that you see of them indicate that that angle is very much greater. But I think that's because they're all designed for 75 ohms. And by reducing the angle, you can bring the computers down to whatever you like. Any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, Arthur, for talking so far. The only directional antenna you've got on the front of the brass antenna on the stage. Yes, the bike will be. Have you actually modeled it? How much gain? The gain would be. Probably about 3 dB uh, more than a, a dipole or whatever. Uh, and often, it's not people call it crazy games. Uh, but they're, my experience with alpha slots is they have negative gain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, it's called a bat wing antenna, an RCA patent of the 1950s. EMI had a relationship with RCO so we could use all their patents, which is why we use them. And what's the influence of the radar? What happens? Uh, if you pick the material well, it has no influence. Uh, if you use PVC, it has a big influence. If you use ABS, then it doesn't have much influence. That's a picture of Dave's Steel toe cap sandals. <laughs> 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 what year was that? 
Robert Owen. That would be 1959. <laughs> Just a long time ago, that thing there is a uh, microwave reflector. The dish is on the ground pointing up, and you bounce it on that to the next um, point. How did you get past the antenna? Because there's no foot points. You climb on the aerial. Oh, on the aerial, yeah, the aerial is still an It's Africa. Aerial. Mm. Oh, we get ten people up there, all doing different work, jobs, and screwing things together. No safety gear. No safety gear, no, no health and safety in those things. Can you, can you, can this? Can you point out the feed points mm. at all? Sorry? Can you point the feed points? Yeah, you can see it there, look, it's just... Oh, it's, the, it's a slot just between the pole and the... the you can see the carracks, see there's the carracks there. Yeah. It's come up the, the antenna and it goes across mm. to the pole to get... The reverse phase shift of this one, where the the carriage comes along the mountain pole and across to the antenna. So these are the carriages. And do they go down the middle of the tube then? No, they go down the outside. Oh, right. um, that's one of the points where they all join together. It must be very busy then as you get yeah, down there. It is. Yeah. And these are these carriages are um, airspace. They've got a uh, helical piece. Of polystyrene that goes around inside them and they fill up with water mm. so easily. So at the top end we moulded these uh, um, what are they called? Anyway, plastic mouldings over the, the end to totally seal them and stop the water getting in. What kind of overall power, transmitter power is that then? Uh, when it's that high Probably five kilowatts. Hmm. It was Did you put D2 in it? Sorry? Did you put D2 in it? <laughs> 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 I wouldn't be up there with a transmitter on. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's interesting. That's often the best way of asking questions. My, my concern is as, as we're moving towards KFDM in Amazon TV, uh, ghosting is going to become less of a problem from reflections, uh, out of phase reflections. but. Um, one thing that I know that a lot of American repeaters and certainly broadcasters use mixed polarization, some call it circular polarization. I think that's probably less than accurate. Uh, have you, would you recommend doing that? Have you any designs of antennas that you think are well, um, viable and practical? Yes, I, I take the point. Um, I personally think circular polarization would be very good very good for long distance DX working. Uh, one of the problems is that the license says that we must use horizontal polarization. And this stems from uh, the RSGB who have felt for many, many years that anything above 70 cents should only be horizontally polarized. So that's got built into the license. I did once make a 23 cent voice repeater and got special permission to use circular polarization and it was great, especially for mobile. That was the one that's uh, bushy. Uh, bushy, yes. If you think of 23 cents uh, mobile, if you think of the mobile fading, um, at two meters it's like going up and down like this. At 23 cents it's, going, it's generating about 300 hertz in tone when you're doing 50 miles an hour. And by using circular polarization, you can largely eliminate that because although the antenna on the car is vertical, um, because the as the signal bounces off buildings and telegraph poles and buildings, whatever, the polarization changes. So whatever polarization the uh, radiation has changed to, the antenna at the repeater end will receive it because it receives all animals of polarization. But we, we, are we restricted to uh, we're restricted to transmitting horizontal polarization, but surely we're not restricted to receiving circular polarization. True, true. Yeah. So perhaps that, that would be an option. Uh, the, the only thing is that most people that use transmit amateur television, the antenna is used also for SSB and other forms of communication where everybody uses horizontal polarization. So, um, 
What do you think of uh, helix antennas? Uh, if you design them properly, they're extremely good. Yeah. And that's the only way to make a circularly polarized antenna is to use a helix. Again, you need to be slightly careful about the feed point. Most of the ways I've seen in the books of feeding them are particularly good. You commented about uh, a matter going to DVB-T, but, but whenever we've been out using QPSK, we've seen very little frequency selective fading. We've only seen flat fading. So I'm not quite sure what the DVB-T is going to do for you. Sorry, uh, uh, aircraft flutter is definitely frequency selective. Yeah, Noel and I have seen this yeah, on uh, yeah. spectrum analyzer <coughs> on our part. I think, I think also the point is that um, DBTT and particularly its um, uh, spectrum um, make it very suitable for bands in, in lower frequencies, like the two meters or four below, you know. But with the lesser number of carriers, so you're losing some of the benefit. I missed a few slides for some reason, but there are some other slots <coughs> and tenors. DAB <coughs> goes down to 197 carriers. These are slots that give that's a vertical gives vertical polarization at eight gigs. Good um, good one in these boxes these days, and that works very well. Um, this is the transmit receive antenna 13 cents for GB3PH. Um, that's a angle, right angle piece of brass with a slot in it. So I've got one here I made earlier. This is the 70 centimeters, so it's not big. But uh, the idea is that this half of the slot radiates in that direction, and this half of the slot radiates at right angles to it. So you get omnidirectional polarization from something like that, and it also gives a very wide bandwidth. It's a bit impractical for most repeated sites, it's big and floppy. And probably blow away in the wind, so this is an alternative, which is a, a 1.2 wavelength loop, which gives you 50 ohms, and is fed across there in the same way that I fed the, the 77 yard mm -hmm. I don't know how I missed that. Okay, thanks David. I think now we can save the best of the last. Okay. So, uh, we've pretty much run out of time. Hope you've all enjoyed the uh, last couple of days, certainly I think uh, we have been here together.